Okay, so this is Dr. Scott Simon. This is my first webinar on spinal fusion surgery. And I think we're, we're going to wait oh, just a couple of minutes to make sure everyone's on. And we're going to start momentarily. Okay, so again, my name is Dr. Scott Simon. I am a neurosurgeon and spinal surgeon with orthopedic and neurosurgery specialists. And our webinar today is on spinal fusion surgery and uh, back pain. And I titled it Uncovering the Truth because there's a lot of misinformation and ill feelings about spinal fusion in particular. And a lot of it needs to be sifted through. Um, So what is uh, spinal fusion? Spinal fusion is really permanently connecting two or more vertebrae in your spine, eliminating the motion between them. And you can see here on this image, the bone is really grown between the vertebra and made it one solid piece. So the success of spinal fusion really depends upon the knitting together of bone. And what that really is, dependent upon is number one, the local bone environment. So that is influenced by surgical technique, how good a carpenter basically I am in terms of making sure the bone is well prepared and fits well with um, between the areas I want to fuse. And also patient factors such as, you know, is the patient obese or diabetic or are they a smoker, have poor bone quality? All these things can sometimes negatively impact the maturation of the bony fusion. And also what we use to fuse, what materials we use to knit those bones together, whether it's allograft or cadaver bone or a demineralized bone matrix, sometimes ceramics, which act as a, a scaffolding for the bony fusion. And there's some growth factors sometimes we can uh, bring to bear on the bony fusion, such as bone morphogenic protein. But autograft is really the gold standard when it comes to bony fusion. And autograft means bone from the body that you're operating on. So bone from somewhere else, usually from the pelvis, that is taken and put into an area where you want to affect the fusion. And the autograft is the only material that really has what we call osteoinductive, osteoconductive, and osteogenic properties. So it really is the best material to use for bone grafting. And you can see on the images on the right, you can see there's bone graft in the disc space right here and then you have bone graft along the sides of the spine so we need to find areas of the spine that we can actually connect together between um, between them so why are fusions done and i'm not going to go totally in a deep dive with respect to all the different um, pathologies that we address with fusion but surface, uh, suffice it to say that there's three main categories that we use um, to determine whether someone needs a spinal fusion. One is deformity, i.e. scoliosis or kyphosis. Kyphosis is a forward bend. Scoliosis, as seen in the picture on the right, is a side bend. Then there's instability. The spine basically unable to do its normal job under physiological loads, meaning that it's just it's not working the way it should. Um, and that could be due to degenerative factors such as arthritis, tumor or infection that can really uh, take away parts of the spine that it relies on to maintain a stable structure, or from surgery. Let's say someone did surgery on someone's spine but took too much of the joint or disc or um, the supporting structures and left the patient with instability. So we have to fuse those, those patients to reestablish stability. 
and just pain is the last one and that's the you know, a little more uh, elusive in terms of making a good diagnosis and so the evaluation is just so important when you're talking about spinal fusion so in my mind it's history 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 is really the cornerstone of any real good uh, evaluation for anything in medicine and it's about just listening to the patient hearing them what's their story is their story does their story make sense so 95 percent of the diagnosis in my mind is from just listening to the patient asking some questions here and there and seeing how they describe their presentation and i think everything else is just supporting your hypothesis that you get while you're listening to the patient so as i'm listening to the patient i already know in my head what possibly could be going wrong wrong with this patient and then I use a physical exam and imaging to um, really confirm the hypothesis. And imaging, I think, could be x-rays, dynamic x-rays I like very much, especially when you're assessing someone for fusion. That means just getting an x-ray with someone bending forward or bending back or bending to the side and seeing how the spine moves under dynamic conditions, not just when they're lying down and supported by a table or bed. Um, and then a scoliosis x-ray, a large x-ray to really see where their head sits over their pelvis, to see their sagittal coronal balance, or really their balance in the both the front to back plane and the side plane, to see are, is that one of the drivers of their instability? And we'll talk about this in a little later. MRIs are very useful to look at the soft tissues, the nerves, the discs. Um, CAT scans are also very useful to look at the bone. So you can see on the top left image, that's an MRI. The nerves can be seen in that spinal channel right in the middle here. These are these nerve rootlets right there. The white is the cerebral spinal fluid. And these are the kidneys, the front of the spine, the back of your spine. This is a cross section. And this is a cross section of the same cut. These are your kidneys, front of the spine, back of the spine. You can see the white is looking at the bone. You can see the trabecula of the bony marrow there, much clearer on this CAT scan, so it's a, it's a bony image. And then people talk about getting potentially EMGs or nerve conduction studies, looking at the electrical signals that are transmitted along the nerves. I find that less helpful, very subjective, and unless you have a real clear question to answer, I find EMGs not only a waste of time, but actually painful. So I think that EMGs are wonderful for certain questions. But just to get to confirm things that already are pretty evident based on your history, your physical and your imaging, I don't think they're useful. And I think that if anything, this talk should be about what you shouldn't do or how to be a real good consumer of your health care and an advocate for your own health. So a lot of that is basically when to say no to certain tests or even surgery. So. What do you do in preparation for a fusion? So let's say you are deemed a good candidate for fusion. And I think some of the things that you can do um, that are the most helpful is make sure you stop smoking if you're a smoker or, or use tobacco products, because smoking and tobacco use are very uh, significantly related to a poor outcome with respect to infection and fusion, meaning that the bones are inhibited from knitting together. Also using Advil, Motrin or Aleve, also can lead to poor bone healing. So stopping both of those before surgery, also the NSAIDs or non steroidal anti-inflammatories such as Advil, Motrin or Aleve can cause bleeding. So that will increase potentially blood loss during the surgery. Hold any anticoagulation that you may be uh, using for whatever reason, whether it's atrial fibrillation or blood clotting disorder um, prior to surgery, because you wanna make sure that again you don't have excessive bleeding during the case and a good evaluation of your bone health whether it's with bone density a bone density study or a cat scan and also getting a vitamin d level i can think can be very helpful because you can start to take vitamin d you know six to eight weeks prior to the, your fusion and get that vitamin d level up to a level that's more normal or even super normal to again make sure that your bony union is good um, medical clearance if you have any medical problems, I think it's always good. This is an elective surgery for the most part. Always good to try to get some medical clearance um, from your regular doctor, the doctors who know you. And if need be, go to a cardiologist or a pulmonologist and have an assessment prior to any surgery. And also arranging for assistance at home. It's, 
wonderful getting a preoperative assessment and getting everything in line. But then when you come back, you may need more help than you were anticipated. So having someone there to help you, I think would be very beneficial. Um, and making sure your work is aware of your surgery and, and can accommodate that. Sometimes you, you're going to be out of work uh, for weeks to sometimes longer after an extensive spinal fusion. And what are the techniques of surgery? So once you sign up for surgery, you're prepared, there are certain techniques that are used. And there's the traditional open techniques, which are safe and have been used for a long, long time, but you can see it's pretty gruesome. It's you know a lot of muscle dissection, potential blood loss, uh, increased muscle injury, and increased infection rate. So I think that there are certain situations where an open technique is very, very, very useful, but it does come with some of, it of, of a cost. And that retractor, extensive retractor time, while you're doing surgery can cause a decrease in the muscle strength and injury that is long lasting to the muscles. So I, I don't think that open surgery is passe. I don't think it it's something that you should absolutely say no to if that's the right surgery for you. But I think there are some minimally invasive techniques that we use to try to spare the muscle and certainly lead these techniques lead to decreased blood loss and decreased infection rate. And what we do is basically make an incision and we dilate away the muscle and spare the muscle and work through a tube. And I find this very useful in people who are a little overweight because whether the, the distance to the spine from the skin is very deep or not, it doesn't matter, you're working through a tube. So you don't have to rely on a big dissection. Um, you just work through the tube and it spares the muscle and it heals up really nicely. Um, so, the pros, definitely less blood loss for minimally invasive surgeries, faster recovery, less post-op pain, shorter length of stay. There's a longer surgical time as you're learning how to do this, but I find that we've been doing this since, you know, the beginning for over, it's got to be over 15 years doing minimally invasive fusions, and it's, it's gotten better every year with techniques that we've used. And um, I find the surgical times are really actually shorter because we don't have to worry about closure and exposure and all all the things that that minimally invasive uh, surgery really obviate, um, alleviates. Um, so what we do is we basically under X-ray guidance or different ways to do. It. Sometimes we use stereotactic navigation with the computer. We put these K wires in into the spine and we're able to put our screws and rods and effect a decompression and put an inner body cage in there. Um, to effect a, 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 a good fusion there. This is an older slide as we don't use those white plastic uh, peak cages so much anymore. Um, but again, it, it speaks to how long we've been doing this. Um, and you can see the nerve sac on the lower picture uh, in the top of the, of the, um, of, the uh, of that picture. And then the L5 and L4 nerve roots are more in the bottom of that picture. Um, and it really, you can you can have a very good visualization, very good decompression, um, and it looks very nice. So here's the decompression you can see after that surgery. Um, right here, I know it's hard to see, but this is the front of the spine, this is the back of the spine, and this is all now wide open and free, whereas before it was very, what's called stenotic. Stenotic is just a fancy word for narrowing of a channel or passage. Um, and you can affect a very solid bony fusion uh, through this technique. Um, there are other minimally invasive techniques. Uh, this is a, what's called a lateral or trans psoas approach. We really don't do trans psoas much anymore. We do what's called anti psoas or in front of the psoas. The psoas muscle is the hip flexor, and that's that muscle you can see right here. And this is the patient on its side, on, on their side. And we dilate away again at corridor in the retroperitoneum, in the patient, in the area behind the, the guts, so to speak and we go down to the spine that way, and it's much less muscle dissection from a posterior approach, but we're able to access the disc in a very complete way and able to put a very large cage um, where we need to, and that can affect a very solid fusion and stabilization at that level. So we were able to put a nice big cage there, and you can see we have these cages now that we were able to jack up like a, a car jack, and what that does is indirectly decompress the spine. So if you have some stenosis here, by jacking that disc up, you stretch out. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. By jacking the disc up, you stretch out the spine and decompress that area. 
Um, and this affects a very nice decompression, minimally invasive, people do very well. Another uh, straight anterior approach is going from the front and really um, moving the intestines off the spine uh, and working through a corridor between the blood vessels and the anterior aspect of the spine. Again, really having a wide access to the disc. Again, you're not affecting a direct decompression of the nerves if need be. So if someone doesn't need a decompression, you can do this in isolation. Sometimes people need what's called a front back where you go from the front and do this procedure, put a cage in from the front and then decompress and fixate from the back as well. So it's a, it's a, a more involved procedure in that sense. And often going from the front requires an access surgeon. So uh, there's some different issues that arise when you're going from the front. And when you're dealing with the cervical spine, a lot of cervical fusions have to do with first dealing with nerve compression and then stabilizing the spine. Because to de decompress the nerve, you need to either go from the front, which is this in this cross section of this cervical spine up, up here. You can go from the back and remove the lamina, or you can do both. And when you're done with that, you have to reestablish some stability. And usually that requires some level of of uh, fusion where you take either the whole disc out and go from the front of the neck, because remember the spine is in the middle of your cervical your neck, or you can go from the back. There's, and there's pros and cons for each, each method. But what's involved in the uh, time right after surgery? You don't have to put yourself into a plastic bubble. You the, Often the instrumentation we use to hold things together, and remember that instrumentation, the screws and the rods that you were seeing, those are all not the fusion. The fusion is the bone knitting together. Those rods, those screws, the plates that we use, the cages that we use, they're all scaffolding and bracing of the spine to allow for the fusion to knit together. So it's like we used to cast the, the spine with either a brace or actual cast and have people in bed rest without any instrumentation. That was still a fusion because we would put bone down you know, along the spine. This bone, the spine would um, the, the spiny fusion would mature that way. But now we use these very strong screws and plates and rods and cages to hold everything steady and strong. And so often patients can be mobilized much quicker with much less concern for quote unquote wrecking the fusion. So the biggest thing right after surgery is just pain management. It's, it sometimes can be painful, especially with a posterior fusion for the first two weeks. Usually at the end of two weeks, people are only taking time at all. Um, I say no NSAIDs, no Advil, Motrin, Aleve. Those are all non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Also no steroids as much as possible um, in, the, in the period of at least three to four months after the, after the fusion. Because again, as we said, those can inhibit the bony fusion. No smoking, obviously that also will inhibit um, the bone growth that we're trying to affect. Um, having good nutrition is really important for bony and soft tissue healing, but don't stay in bed. Be active. And often I tell people walking is very good. Don't overdo it, but listen to your body. I think that driving after at least two weeks, sometimes shorter, depending on um, if they're off pain medications you, earlier, but usually plan for no no extensive driving for two weeks. You can be a passenger in the car, but no driving. And we, we, call, we say no BLTs. So no bending, lifting, twisting for at least six weeks. You can shower, but no submerging the incisions. And often we tell patients you can shower the day after surgery or the next, the, um, or even the day after that sometimes, really depending on, on what the closure is. But for the most part, fusions nowadays are much quicker in their recovery and mobilization than they ever used to be. Um, what are the restrictions finally after the fusion takes? Well, um, these are two of my patients here. The one on the right is a marathon runner after a lumbar fusion. The one below is a professional um, MMA fighter who has a cervical fusion, you can do very vigorous activity after the fusion. But you do that activity, you approach that activity in a stepwise fashion. You don't go play 18 holes of golf at week six. You go to the driving range, you start hitting a little bit, you build it up. Same thing with tennis. You don't play a set, you play a rally. Same thing with running. You run on a treadmill indoors for you know five ten minutes see how it feels and then build it up everything is really too tolerance i am very non-dogmatic i don't give set timelines for anything because everyone heals differently everyone responds differently and everyone's surgery is a little different what are the outcomes i think this is a very important slide and i think that 
the most important thing on this slide is the first line. Really, the outcome depends on the surgeon operating for the right reason. That seems really simple, but this is where fusions get their, their bad rap because fusions are done potentially for the wrong reason. Um, I think that a diagnosis of lumbar radiculopathy or nerve pain or cervical radiculopathy, doing a fusion to alleviate arm or leg pain when you need to do a fusion without, you can't simply do a decompression. When you need to do a fusion for that, the outcomes are very, very good. When you have what's called spinal anesthesis or degenerative slip of your spine, the outcomes are very good. Similarly, the outcomes are very good for treating tumor of the spine, infections of the spine, all very good. When you get to things like degenerative disc disease with where you have neck pain or back pain in isolation, with no arm pain, no leg pain, the diagnosis is more murky and more difficult to pin down. And I've been doing this a long time. People have been writing about this for a long time. Um, and beware someone who's very certain uh, that they know exactly where your neck or back pain is coming from. You really need a very thorough workup to make sure that whoever is recommending surgery is doing that surgery for the right reason. Again, a perfect surgery done for the wrong reason is not going to help. And a bad surgery done for the wrong reason especially won't help. And the biggest thing you want to make sure is that the surgeon is thinking, do no harm. They don't want to make you worse. Uh, the other thing is when you're committing to surgery and a fusion in particular, you want to make sure that not only are you decompressing the nerves and you're affecting a solid bony union, but you're maintaining normal spinal balance or correcting it if you need to. So for instance, on this image on the right, this was a surgery that was done in one of the university hospitals um, in New York, and this fusion looked okay, but she was miserable. And if you looked at the more global picture of her spine, she's really tipped forward. So they fused her basically what's called flat and she has what's called a sagittal imbalance or sagittal malalignment. Her head is way over her pelvis requiring a big correction that we had to do. And so, you know, maintaining good posture in the spine is really important when you start putting in rods and screws and locking that spine in position with your fusion. Psychosocial factors are also really critical to um, really take into account when signing someone up for a fusion procedure because patients with anxiety and depression can often have a poor outcome. And I think that spending time with those patients, really making sure they're comfortable and understand everything and have good support, not only before, but after the surgery, I think is really critical to making sure they have a good outcome. What is actually very interesting is that ongoing litigation and workman's comp cases have a poor outcome than those without ongoing litigation or those without any work and comp cases. And that's been pretty well documented in the literature. I'm not saying these patients are malingering in any way, but it's it's the complexity of the issues that are um, at, at present for those cases that I think in, um, uh, impact negatively on those patients' outcomes. Also making sure they have, again, good support, as I mentioned, and patient factors. Going back to that one of those first slides where we talked about what is the milieu, what is the um, bony uh, patient factors that will uh, help make the patient heal? Um, are they smokers? Are they not smokers? Are they healthy? Are they malnutrition, mal malnourished? What's their age? Are they younger or older? What are the complications of fusion? And you know, a lot of these talks, sometimes we just really gloss over everything and make sure everything is really presented in a rosy picture. Surgery, and especially fusion surgery of the spine, should be undertaken only as a last resort because there are some potentially serious complications can, that can occur even when the surgery is done correctly. And I think it's important to know. And I think that you, when picking a surgeon, and I'm, I'm not saying this for my benefit, but you need to make sure not only your surgeon is um, a, a, has good ability, has good technical ability, but is available because even the best surgeons have complications. Everyone has complications sometimes. And you want to make that, that sure that surgeon is not going to abandon you or not be responsive to you if you still have pain after the surgery. You want to make sure that they're taking care of you as a person, not just you know, you know, you know, throwing up their hands and saying, well, my surgery would be fine. Uh, everything else is on you. That's not the way a doctor should be, not a way a surgeon should be. So what are the complications? Failure or fusion? Pseudoarthrosis. That means that, that the bones don't knit together. And so if the bones don't knit together, people can have pain, 
they can have failure of their hardware or deformity um, at the level of the fusion, meaning that it's like building a building. If the concrete doesn't take and there's always movement, that those screws that are in the concrete will wiggle and wiggle and wiggle until they break. And you can see that in the top left picture where you have haloing or that darkness around those screws. Those screws are wiggling loose because the fusion hasn't taken and those screws are, are not able to hold well in a bone that's moving around them and they're wiggling loose. So in the, in the middle picture here, you can see that there's a fracture through the rod um, because of that pseudoarthrosis or non-union. And then you can have deformity either above or within the fusion itself where the, sp the spine starts to bend and twist uh, in the areas that are not fused and, are, and where, the where the hardware is, has um, failed. You can also have adjacent level deterioration, meaning that the areas above or below the fusion can deteriorate. You can have degenerative disc disease or joint changes that can lead to pain, deformity. Um, as you see in this picture right here, this is a, a fusion that's done here. And you can see he's developed this horrible, what's called kyphosis or bend above the fusion. This is called proximal junctional kyphosis or PJK. Or you can have um, return of any kind of nerve compression that was dealt with at the level of the fusion, but now is developing above be or below because of these adjacent level deterioration factors. So again, not only is it necessary to make sure that you know the fusion is done correctly, but that you monitor your patient and make sure they're doing well. And if they're not doing well, to investigate why they're not doing well. So what are the alternatives? Now that I scared the dickens out of you, what are the alternatives to spinal fusion? So um, physical therapy, injections, I think anything that gets rid of your pain, as long as, as, long as you don't have anything dangerous, such as infection or tumor, I think that the, 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 um, the world is your oyster. You t do whatever you need to do to get rid of your pain, um, because a lot of times um, these fusions are elective. They can really be put on hold. They don't need to be do done emergently. Some surgeons will say, well, you're going to be paralyzed if you don't do the surgery. That's very, very rarely the case, very rarely the case, especially in the lumbar spine. So I think that waiting, making sure fusions or any surgery is a last resort is always appropriate. If you have pain that is not well um, uh, explained by your imaging studies, especially in your extremities, things called spinal cord stimulators sometimes can be beneficial. Uh, simple decompressions when arm or leg pain predominates due to nerve compression can often be accomplished without any fusion. I often see patients who were recommended for lumbar fusions or cervical fusions that a simple decompression done minimally invasive completely ameliorates their symptoms without any need for rods or screws or bone grafting. And that's very gratifying. It works out well. And the risk of those operations is a fusion that, you know, you needed the surgery, but um, unfortunately, you would need a fusion down the road at some point. I think there's an adage in spine surgery, which I find really overly aggressive. That adage is always do the last surgery first, but no one knows. No one has a crystal ball. No one knows when that last surgery will be, what that last surgery will be, what needs to be um, involved. So uh, my, my feeling is you can always add more salt to the soup. You know, no one likes this, be told that you may need more surgery, but no one knows what the last surgery anyone would need um, would be. So doing a fusion doesn't always mean that it's the last surgery that person will need. So you know, if you're able to get away with the smaller surgery, I think that's sometimes the better, uh, the better way to go. There's also, also these interspinous spacers, um, the most famous of which are called X-stops. That's the, the, the device on the right, which um, is a, a device that spreads the spine out and prevents bony compression or tries to alleviate bony comp compression due to that. And you can see this person has a slip or what's called a spondylolisthesis here that's being pushed forward. I just happened to ha see this person today, so I grabbed their films and put it on there. But this the, the spine is being pushed forward by this, this device further, and she had severe leg pain um, that had to be addressed with a fusion. Um, so we were able to reduce her and, and fuse her and her leg pain's gone, her back pain's gone, she's feeling great. Um, artificial disc replacements, a lot of people talk about. In the lumbar spine, it's very controversial. It was all the rage in the 90s, but then people just did not do well from them, and uh, we had to take them out 
um, in the neck. Uh, some people are really hot on artificial disc replacement. I, I personally am not a, a big believer in cervical artificial discs, but many people do, are. So I think that um, it's a discussion to have. Uh, I don't think, I think sometimes things that sound good, you have to make sure are good for you. Um, because a lot of people try to get you on your operating table. Many patients to many doctors are viewed as widgets. You're a source of income. Operating on you, you know, gives the doctor um, money. And so you have to be, you know, buyer beware, making sure that they're doing the right thing by you. Make sure that, that your doctor doesn't have any uh, financial interest in doing anything to you. Some of these doctors have uh, stake and stock in different medical supply companies and will use the instrumentation that they put their stock in or even more have have a more direct uh, uh, relationship with some instrumentation. So be aware of that and uh, you can ask them and also that should be available online. Um, laser spine surgery, a lot of people ask about this. The Laser Spine Institute is you now bankrupt and, and out of business in Florida. They were the most famous Laser Spine Institute. Um, using the laser really suggests that there's no incision involved, that fusions can be accomplished somehow by the laser just pointing a light at the patient's back. Lasers were, were will burn if shined on someone's back. So you need to make basically do the same surgery everyone else does. And then you wand the laser around there just to say you used it for some very trivial portion of the case. And there's been a lot of malpractice suits and debunking of laser spine surgery. It's been laser's been around since the 1960s, and I, I find I find not useful for spine surgery. Robotics. This is a new hot topic, and and robotics have been very useful for the right patients. And I find, I just did a robotic. This is a case I just did um, last week uh, for a, a, a T10 fracture. Um, and I think the robot is really good for, for some things and not and a little cumbersome for others, but it allows us to really precisely put our screws in. And why is that important? Why do we need the screws in so precisely? Well, I think if you look at this picture, this is a CAT scan that we use to plan our surgery. This was before any surgery was done, before the, sur the patient was even in the room. This was all planned. We, we were able to plan exactly where the screws go, how the rod's gonna fit, and we can see here that the screw is going to go into the bone. This is the aorta, a huge artery that feeds um, the body. And a screw placed in the aorta or a screw placed in the spinal canal where the spinal cord lives would be a devastating complication. So the robot really allows us precision when placing our instrumentation. And we can do it minimally invasive, as was done in this case. You can see me, you know, looking at the monitor as this as I'm putting the screws in. Um, and we need this little reference frame that we put on this patient's spine to have the robot, which is here, track where we're going to be in reference to the preoperatively obtained CT that we had. So we got a key CT before surgery, and we we plan our surgery, and the robot we link that that. CT with the intraoperative imaging we obtained in the OR, and then we we're able to really use the the uh, the oh, what's called the end effector of the robot to help guide where we put our screws. And I think that's been great for for certain procedures. Some procedures is just unnecessary. And artificial discs we talked about a little bit, but now I really want to open it up to uh, the questions that hopefully will be coming 